Greetings. Welcome back to the channel as we close out the Roaring Twenties and explore the sci-fi films of 1929. As the 20s ended, the world was on the brink of a new era politically and culturally. By the end of the decade, there was a stock market crash that spiraled into the 1930s, causing great upheaval around the world. Cinema itself was undergoing a metamorphosis as it turned from silent to sound. Science fiction as a genre was truly beginning to separate itself from fantasy and horror to stand on its own. We'll see more of this, especially the departure from horror in the 1930s. The allure of the unknown, the cosmic mysteries, and the uncharted territories of scientific imagination beckoned filmmakers and audiences. Sound was beginning to take the sci-fi world by storm, greatly affecting areas of filmmaking including dialogue, sound design, and sound effects that added new layers to alien worlds, journeys to the cosmos, and fantastical stories. Filmmakers and studios also had to take on new cost to their production budgets with sound technology, reconfiguring studios for filmmaking, acquiring and even inventing new equipment. Nevertheless, in 1929, films were still a captivating mix of sound and silence. Some, like Fritz Lang's Woman in the Moon, clung to the traditions of silent cinema, while others, such as Midstream, ventured into the realm of sound. Director Maurice Elvey even crafted two versions of High Treason, one silent and one sound, each with its unique advantages and challenges, embodying the dynamic crossing of technology and storytelling in the transformative cinematic era. Just a reminder that all videos discussed today are available for free on YouTube, except for the partially recovered lost film Midstream. The 10 minutes of recovered footage is available on YouTube. However, unfortunately, the rest is still missing. Before we dive into the films of 1929, if you're enjoying the content, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe for your regular dose of sci-fi history. In the mid-1920s, Hollywood studio MGM was looking to create its own big creature success, like The Lost World, and instead they got The Mysterious Island, an American film that, after some studio meddling, was loosely based on the Jules Verne 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea sequel of the same name from 1875. The original story was written to give a backstory to Captain Nemo, whose real name is Count Dakar. Directed by Lucien Hubbard, this part talkie brings the spirit of Verne's adventure story to life with a mix of action, exploration, and imaginative creatures. But it is more fantasy with sci-fi elements than anything else. Starring Lionel Barrymore, Jacqueline Gasden, and Lloyd Hughes, it was filmed in the two-color technicolor process with some black and white sequences. This financial failure had a budget of $1.13 million and lost MGM almost $900,000. Set in the fantastical world on a volcanic island near the kingdom of Hetvia, we meet benevolent Count Dakar, a visionary scientist who has created a utopian society. He works alongside his daughter, Sonia, and a brilliant engineer, Roger. The Count builds a radical new submarine, Meanwhile, the despotic Baron Fallon seizes control of Hetvia, setting off a chain of events that thrusts the island into chaos. As Dakar and his daughter face the Baron's tyranny, Roger fights for their survival by traveling underwater to a strange realm of monsters and sea creatures, encountering dragons, giant squid, and an unknown humanoid race at the ocean's depths. The production of the film was troublesome at best, with weather issues, specifically a hurricane, during location shooting. And the film changed directors three times, with Hubbard the only credited director on the project. To make matters worse, the production was halted after the jazz singer became successful. Studio MGM demanded that the mysterious island be turned into a talkie. This strange period for silent films that were turned into talkies to satisfy studio demands 
to jump onto the next big thing had various levels of success. This one would have worked better as a silent film, in my opinion. The production difficulties and the studio's meddling with the story to move away from the original material led to a film that was dull and even more like fantasy, but with submarines. Color prints of the film have been recovered, and a completed Technicolor print was shown in 2014. The film was remade in 1961, directed by Cy Enfield, and had stop-motion effects by Ray Harryhausen. High Treason, a British film directed by Maurice Elvey, was adapted from a play by Noel Pemberton Billing. Starring Jameson Thomas, Benita Hume, and Basil Gill, the film underwent an evolution unique to this time. Initially crafted as a silent production and later reworked into a talkie, Persuaded by the studio, LV spliced in dialogue over existing footage for the sound version. Both versions can be found on YouTube, and I do recommend watching them side by side to see firsthand the changes from silent to sound. The President of the Federated States of Europe, speaking to the world. The side-by-side -side experiment is the most intriguing part of the film. Though it was an interesting premise, the storyline wandered a bit. The silent version, set in 1950, leaned heavily on visual elements, while the sound version changed the setting to 1940, but with all the same production design and visual elements, harnessed the power of direct information relayed to the characters and audience, along with sci-fi sound effects. In a future world on the brink of war, High Treason delves into political tensions, technological leaps, and the specter of global conflict. The stage is set between two superpowers, the Allied Powers and the Confederation of the Pacific. As tensions escalate, the film explores the romantic entanglements of a British scientist and a diplomat's daughter, examining the ethical dilemmas posed by advanced military technology. The film's futuristic vision, brought to life by Andrew Mazet's ambitious art design and Percy Strong's cinematography, showcasing innovative miniatures and set designs ahead of its time. Political allegory weaves through the narrative, exploring the complexities of war and the sacrifices made for the greater good. The film introduced feminist elements, portraying a future marked by sexual equality, where women wear men's clothing and register for the draft, while at the same time maintaining their femininity. Influenced by Metropolis, High Treason serves as a precursor to the sci-fi of the 1930s, paving the way for films like Just Imagine and Things to Come. Though I found the story to be meandering and the end a bit abrupt, I did appreciate the scope and world building while trying to discuss peaceful outcomes in a time when, in our reality, the next world war was only 10 years away. American production Midstream blends silent film elements with occasional sound sequences. It is lost today except for one 10-minute segment. Because only a small portion is available to view, I must rely on online accounts of the plot. According to IMDb, the story is, quote, Following a successful experimental operation to reverse age, a wealthy businessman stages his own death and assumes the identity of his nephew. His spurious pursuit of a young woman eventually catches up with him, as does his age, unquote. And the fan website for lead actress Claire Windsor has some great photos as well as narrative of the plot from Motion Pictures Story Magazine. I'll link to the website if you would like to check it out. The only available footage, a performance of the opera Faust with cutaways to lead actors Ricardo Cortez and Claire Windsor in the audience. This segment was found in 2003 and appears on the two-DVD set of the 1925 edition of The Phantom of the Opera, as well as on YouTube, but doesn't give us any idea of the plot and doesn't feel sci-fi in any way. Under the direction of James Flood and starring Cortez, Windsor, and Montague Love, Midstream was a completed silent film before the decision was made to turn it into a talkie. It does sound like an intriguing plot, 
one that will be utilized many times in future films. Woman in the Moon was Fritz Lang's follow-up to Metropolis and his last silent film before moving to talkies. Written by Lang's collaborator and wife, Thea von Harba, it stars Willie Fritsch, Gerda Morris, and Klaus Pohl. Based on Harba's novel, The Rocket to the Moon, this landmark science fiction film loosely follows the structure of Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon. The film is notable for its pioneering portrayal of space travel and is considered one of the earliest serious attempts at depicting space exploration on screen. The story revolves around a professor, an eccentric visionary who believes in the existence of gold on the moon. He teams up with several people, his assistant, as well as another professor, and a stowaway. They make plans for a lunar expedition and build a rocket, the Frida, and embark on a daring journey to the moon. Complicating matters is the character of Frida, who joins the men even though she is entangled in a love triangle with two of the men on the journey. Despite the interpersonal dynamics, the mission is fueled by the quest for scientific discovery and the potential riches awaiting them on the lunar surface. And like many movies, it doesn't go as planned. They encounter breathable air, find gold, but also face confrontations with each other, leading to destruction of a portion of the ship, resulting in one person having to stay behind so that the rest can have enough oxygen for the trip home. The film features impressive special effects, especially in its portrayal of the rocket launch and the weightlessness experienced by the astronauts. Lang's meticulous attention to detail and his collaboration with science advisor Hermann Oberth, a pioneer in rocketry, contributed to the film's scientific accuracy and innovative representation of space travel. The scientific authenticity shows what the imagination and scientific knowledge could achieve in 1929. Oberth was a pioneering figure in rocketry and was considered the greatest living resource on space travel at the time. Oberth would go on to oversee the Nazi V-2 rocket program. The film sets, designed by Metropolis's Otto Hunte, were elaborate and contributed to the overall visual spectacle. The depiction of the moon's surface and the subterranean caverns, though not as scientifically accurate, were still beautiful to watch. And like High Treason, Woman in the Moon begins to tackle women's issues in society and science fiction, but this one goes even farther, with a main female character playing an intelligent, driven, and problem-solving woman who doesn't need to be rescued. Many of the reviews for the time were positive, from Variety praising the film's technical accomplishments to the New York Times, quote, This German-made picture has the distinction of being one of the first on any screen to offer a plausible, if not altogether practical, idea of what interplanetary travel might be, unquote. Lang wanted the first half of the story to ground the characters on Earth and create drama. The second half of the story really kicks into gear. From the launch of the spacecraft until the end of the film, this is where Lang's direction shines. This film would not only go on to help define the genre, but also influence filmmakers, audiences, and scientists on the wonders of rocketry and space exploration. The end of the decade saw the publication of several captivating science fiction novels and pulp magazine short stories. Beyond shaping the genre, some of these would go on to inspire future filmmakers and storytellers, either as direct adaptations or as seeds for future sci-fi adventures. The Disintegration Machine by Arthur Conan Doyle First published in The Strand magazine, this story tells the tale of a machine that can disintegrate and then recreate objects. Though never adapted into film, many works from the famed Sherlock Holmes author served as inspirations for readers. The Air Cellar by Alexander Bilyayev First published in a Russian-language magazine as a series of short stories, this tale from the famed Russian writer is set in a futuristic world where air has been commodified and sold. 
It was adapted into a 1967 Soviet feature of the same name. And some notable storytellers that were born in this year. George Clayton Johnson. Born July 10th, American writer George Clayton Johnson would co-write the novel Logan's Run, which would become the basis for the 1976 feature film. Johnson also wrote scripts for the series The Twilight Zone, as well as the first aired episode of Star Trek entitled The Man Trap. Ira Levin, born August 27th. American novelist and playwright Ira Levin wrote the novels A Kiss Before Dying, Rosemary's Baby, The Stepford Wives, and The Boys from Brazil. History, culture, the sciences, and the arts were all part of a dynamic tapestry that, when woven together, create a story in time. Nothing occurs in isolation. Each element both shapes and is shaped by the unfolding narrative of history. Science fiction writers and filmmakers were influenced by the events of their time. To truly appreciate the sci-fi films created in 1929, it is also important to take a brief glance at the events that go on to shape society and our shared human experience. And so for the rest of this episode, I will focus on the world at large, both culturally and in cinema. The Lateran Treaty. On February 11th, the Vatican City was established as an independent state within Rome. This ended a long-standing dispute between the Catholic Church and the Italian government. The treaty was signed by Pope Pius XI and King Victor Emmanuel III with his Prime Minister Benito Mussolini. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre On February 14th in Chicago, seven members of the North Side Gang were killed in a shootout. This became one of the most infamous events in the history of organized crime in the United States. The Wall Street Crash of 1929 on October 29th, the New York Stock Exchange experienced a massive crash. This event is often considered the spark of the Great Depression and had widespread economic repercussions worldwide. René Magritte and the Treachery of Images This surrealist masterpiece challenges the conventional perceptions of reality. Featuring a pipe with the caption, Ce n'est pas un pipe, this is not a pipe. Magritte prompts viewers to question the relationship between representation and reality, emphasizing the deceptive nature of images and language in conveying truth. The publication of several important and influential novels. William Faulkner published The Sound and the Fury, a landmark of modernist literature, while Ernest Hemingway published A Farewell to Arms, exploring the impact of World War I. Edwin Hubble's discovery of the expanding universe. American astronomer Edwin Hubble published his observations and calculations that demonstrated the expansion of the universe. The more distant a galaxy is from us, the faster it appears to be receding into space. This discovery led to the formulation of Hubble's law, providing key evidence for the Big Bang Theory. By the end of the 1920s, Hollywood was the dominant force in the film industry, but European and Soviet filmmakers were also creating avant-garde masterpieces. When we dive into the world of sci-fi cinema from this time, it's crucial to zoom out a bit and look at what else was going on. Films of all genres play an important role in shaping history. So here's some of the more popular and influential non-science fiction films released in 1929. Man with a Movie Camera. Directed by Zega Vertov, this silent documentary is renowned for its experimental editing and cinematography techniques. It is considered a landmark in documentary filmmaking. Un Chien Andalou, a French silent short film directed by Louise Buñuel and co-written with Salvador Dali, was a radical surrealist film that is famous for its shocking and dreamlike imagery. The Broadway Melody Directed by Harry Beaumont, this was the first sound film to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. This musical helped establish the popularity of the genre in the early sound era. 
Blackmail, an early film from future auteur Alfred Hitchcock. This was the first British sound feature film and showed off the beginnings of Hitchcock's mastery of suspense. Hallelujah. This culturally significant musical drama was directed by King Vidor and is one of the earliest major studio films to feature an all-African-American cast. The Coconuts, directed by Robert Flory and Joseph Santley, this musical comedy features the Marx Brothers in their first film and showcases their distinctive comedic style. In the dynamic landscape of 1929, the worlds of film and soon-to-be television witnessed a whirlwind of technical innovations and business events that would reshape the entertainment industry. The Establishment of the Academy Awards The Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences was first created by Louis B. Mayer, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and many other notable figures of the time. To benefit those who worked in the industry, it is best known for its annual award show that became known as the Oscars. The first film awards ceremony took place in May 1929, highlighting achievements of the film industry from 1927 and 1928. Wings from 1927 became the first film to win the award for Best Picture. Inventor Leon Theremin patents his theremin music instrument. In 1929, inventor Leon Theremin received a patent for an electronic musical instrument that produces ethereal sounds without physical contact. This groundbreaking device paved the way for electronic music innovation and became an iconic element in various musical genres. It also influenced the film industry, particularly for film scores and sound design, and was used in feature films such as the 1951 classic, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Demonstration of the Zvarkin Television System Russian-American inventor Vladimir Zvarkin, known today as the father of television, created the iconoscope, an all-electric camera tube, and the kinetoscope, a cathode ray picture tube that laid the foundation for the modern television system. In the archives of cinematic history, the end of the 1920s stand as a pivotal chapter, witnessing the metamorphosis of science fiction films from the silent era to the dawn of sound. The shift ushered in a new era of storytelling possibilities, forever altering the landscape of speculative cinema. The films of 1929 explored humanity's interest with the cosmos, visions of what the future could look like, the mix of technological advances in a world of fantasy creatures, and the dangers of human experimentation. As the curtain fell on the 1920s, it also rose on the promise of a new decade, one that would reshape filmmaking forever. The 1930s would herald not only the extension, but the refinement of the sound era, bringing about unprecedented advances in narrative techniques, visual effects, and storytelling structures. Filmmakers would grapple with economic challenges, cultural shifts, and the unstoppable march of technology, birthing a cinematic landscape that would resonate with audiences for generations to come. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for future videos about the history of sci-fi cinema. In the next episode, I'll look at the films from 1930.